got the interview. Next flight to Chicago. Zoom in. Good. The assassination of Bobby Kennedy symbolizes a time of terrible turmoil and tragedy. But was his killer simply a pawn in a bigger conspiracy? I think Sirhan was programmed to show up shooting and programmed to forget. The murder of Robert Kennedy. The argument for the real-life Manchurian candidate. We're going in. Just one question. We gotta go live. The best thing I had going for me was I had no contact with Washington for all those years. Admiral James Stockdale has changed his view on Washington. So he's racing Dan Quayle and Al Gore to the White House. Who am I? Why am I here? Now, the man who was America's highest ranking POW in Vietnam wants to be vice president. Let's go. Stand by. He's one of the richest men in the West and owns everything from caterpillars to the catwalk. But the boy who never knew his real parents says he leads the simple life. We actually live quite a frugal life. We're sitting on a 58-foot boat here. I can't call that frugal. Well, we certainly live reclusively. An Inside Edition exclusive on the orphan who became a billionaire. Hello, I'm Peter Luck and welcome to Inside Edition All Round Australia. Tonight, a heartbreaking story. A mother-to-be is taken to hospital for the delivery of her child, but when she awakes after the birth, she's told her baby's son was born dead. She mourns for 20 years, then makes a terrible discovery. Rick Kirkham joins us for that incredible story and tells us how he tracked the truth across America. But first, Robert Kennedy was a champion for the poor and downtrodden. With the recent racial unrest in Los Angeles, more attention is focused on who was behind his murder. Inside Edition has spoken exclusively with his assassin, Sirhan Sirhan, and to others who think they know why he died. Daniel S. Goldfarb files this special report. If we have that love and friendship and understanding for our fellow citizens, we will have a new America. On June 4th, 1968, Bobby Kennedy was hard at work in L.A. to ensure victory in the day's critical California primary. At the same time, a man who couldn't vote, a Palestinian refugee named Sirhan Sirhan, spent election day at a pistol range practicing with his new gun. Spent the whole day over there, and uh, I thought I had a pretty good piece. Sirhan says he then drove aimlessly downtown. He found himself at a party at the Ambassador Hotel. I didn't know that Senator Kennedy was down there at, at that night. And I didn't know, I didn't even know what, what was happening at the embassy, other than that there was a big party. It was sort of enjoyable to me, but uh, it, it ended in, in, in tragedy. Shortly after midnight on the 5th of June, Senator Robert Kennedy entered the ballroom of a Los Angeles hotel to a thunderous reception from his friends and supporters. The California primary was his, and that guaranteed him the Democratic nomination for president. It was the shining moment of his political career. It was also his last. Minutes later, Robert F. Kennedy would be assassinated. There seemed to be no question that his killer was Sirhan Sirhan. He was caught with the smoking gun still in his hand. Just last month, a group of politicians, celebrities, and ex-law enforcement officials called for a grand jury investigation. They believe that Sirhan may have been under the control of others and that the Los Angeles Police Department destroyed the evidence that could have proven that Sirhan did not act alone. Paul Schrade was wounded by the same gunfire that killed Bobby Kennedy. Those uh, ceiling panels and that portion of the center provider were destroyed by the police department. One of the group's leaders is Dr. Philip Melanson, director of the Robert F. Kennedy Assassination Archives at the Southeastern Massachusetts University. He says the evidence in the library points to a conspiracy and that Sirhan was being controlled by others. His mind was tampered with. Um, as a rich record of that, as, as sensational as it sounds, he was an excellent hypnotic subject. 
He practiced hypnosis on his own. He was wandering from doctor to doctor to get help. Sirhan's own diary does repeatedly refer to mind control. You say that Sirhan was programmed, controlled, almost brainwashed to kill Robert Kennedy. It sounds like science fiction. As a matter of fact, it sounds like you watched the Manchurian Candidate mm -hmm. movie one time too many. What people don't understand about the Manchurian Candidate theory and the movie is that that movie was based on Condon's conversations, as I understand it, with people who were actually involved in CIA mind control research. In Richard Condon's movie, The Manchurian Candidate, a soldier, played by Lawrence Harvey, was brainwashed to the point that his mind was totally controlled. Shoot Bobby Raymond through the forest. After some trial runs, he was told to kill a presidential candidate. Do you think that Sirhan was programmed in this manner? I think Sirhan was programmed to show up shooting and programmed to forget. But the professor says that because of the evidence that was destroyed, they may never know who the co-conspirators were. Sirhan is now serving a life sentence at the California Correctional Facility at Soledad. And in an exclusive interview with Inside Edition, he says that meeting RFK in the hotel's kitchen was a total accident. Had he taken the original route which he was uh, intended for him to take, he, he might have been saved and he, he might have been, you know, become president of the United States. That's one of the myths of this case. Uh, on stage, it seems to be that one of his entourage is saying, this way, Senator, and changing the route. But if you look at the documents, lots of people knew it. In sworn depositions, Bobby Kennedy's security personnel stated that the senator's planned exit route was through the hotel kitchen. The point being that conspiracy confederates could easily have planted the assassin in the right place. Sirhan claims that no matter what the documents might say, he acted alone. I could never be a part of a conspiracy. My very nature would never allow me to do that. Sirhan's diary certainly indicated that he planned to kill Bobby Kennedy, and it also showed a mind that was obviously in a confused state. At the time of the shooting, I was not really in full control of my senses, because I don't feel that a, a rational, uh, calm, cool, and, and, and a, a person who has his wits about him and is aware of his environment would actually pull a gun and aim it at another human being. And shoot at him with the foreknowledge that after you finish shooting that that person is going to be you know dead the cia's released file on its manchurian candidate activity and their own documents suggest that they thought the manchurian candidate was possible and that they had worked in that regard to program one although they claimed they never used it we may never know what really happened but after 24 years in prison sirhan has rationalized his awful crime but, you know, you can also argue the other side of the, of the, of the coin there. Uh, Robert Kennedy could have been, you know, he could have pushed the nuclear button had occasion, you know, required it when he, if he, should he have become president. Interest in the Kennedys increases rather than diminishes as the years pass. This Thursday on Network 10, a special presentation, the first episode of the miniseries The Kennedys of Massachusetts, will air at 8.30 p.m. Coming up next on Inside Edition. Cambodia today, recovering from the terrors of Pol Pot. He left the nation maimed, its people grieving. The Pol Pot killed my family, the mother, father, sister, the niece, uncle, person, has and me, only one. As the Khmer Rouge rise again, Inside Edition goes inside the killing fields. Kerry Packer from Consolidated Press Holdings, Rupert Murdoch from the International Media Conglomerate, News Corp, Kerry Stokes from Australian Capital Equity. Kerry Stokes? Well, every time there's a big media deal these days, the name Kerry Stokes comes up, but who exactly is he? The West Australian billionaire has a passion for deals and diving, for art, basketball and beautiful women. This unexpected entrepreneur gave Inside Edition this exclusive look at his world and talked about his marriage to the woman many consider the most beautiful in Australia. I love the water. I love, I love being on the water. I love clearing the heads anywhere, going to sea. Uh, I love diving. Diving's been a long-term passion of mine. Kerry Stokes in one of the places he loves best, far from what they call the real world. Uh, righto, the Abrolis, um, 
Maldives, um, Red Sea, yeah, a lot of places. He'll be six fathoms down, but a million miles from the boardroom, billionaires and basketball. In 1991, and Perth goes berserk as the NBL Basketball Premiership comes back to the West for the second year running. Local heroes are lauded, and who, they ask, is the guy in the suit telling us how to save the state. So let's all get behind the state, as well as the Wildcats, and make the Wildcats successful and the state successful again. Thank you. Kerry Stokes, who owns the Wildcats, as well as a good part of the West, is the sort of bloke who'll pull up the steps on his own executive jet and loan it to his boys when the airlines go on strike. I'm on my way, I'm making it. After the other Kerry and Rupert, he's about the biggest media player we've got. I've got to make it show, yeah. He has three boats like this. This is the middle one, only 58 feet long. So much larger than life. But he's not only into toys. He makes the big cats which service the mining industry. We've gone through a recession period where that company is the largest employer of apprentices in Western Australia. We haven't put any apprentice off. We haven't reduced our workforce. We've had sufficiently good management. The whole workforce has been maintained. And we've got a very happy crew out there. Mm. I'm very proud of that. He's got his fingers in a lot of pies, and some of them got burned when he bought one of the biggest buildings in the world in Texas. But his other investments have made millions, and he owns some of Australia's most valuable works of art. For example, the glover that's there was um, painted in uh, about 1840. And yet, ironically, he's an enigma. While he's one of the biggest media players in the country, he's hardly a household name. In fact, he was hardly known to Australians until the recently announced merger between the tycoon and the famous actress Peter Tapano. So, exactly who is Kerry Stokes? Well, to understand the man, you have to understand that he has no roots. He's an orphan who doesn't know anything about his parents. The most important people involved in basketball are our families. A man to whom family is now terribly, terribly important. His mother, who has come all the way from Peachtree, Alabama, to be with James this evening. Every basketballer should remember the most important person in your life is your mother. Today he drives a Porsche, but Stokes' childhood was tough, poor and pretty unhappy. The couple who adopted him, Matt and Irene, were classic Aussie soldier settler battles. They themselves had difficult pasts, people coming out of the Depression, uh, very poor families, coming from um, very low education, um, because those were the times. Matt was an itinerant worker. Um, he served in the RAAF in New Guinea. He was medically discharged. I remember visiting him in the hospital. I remember seeing the ulcers. Um, lots of people came back from the uh, jungles um, with, with lots of scars. Mm. Matt was one of them. On his 14th birthday, Kerry got a job in a wool store. Then he went bush and began work in a shearing shed, hoping to be a wool classer. When you were 14 and 15, um, you were at the bottom end of the pecking order. Yeah, you got knocked around a bit and kicked around and expected to do things that uh, in those days was really the shit work yeah. the kid did. But Young Kerry had plenty of problems, not the least, no education and dyslexia. I have grave problems with, form I can't form word pictures. And it's very embarrassing because some people claim to have a problem with remembering names. Yes. I can't pull a name to my mind. I, I tend to like dealing in numbers, numbers I remember. He certainly had no trouble with the numbers, from tar boy in a shearing shed to television proprietor. It's a long story and some of it had to do with luck. He made a bid for the Seven Network and Scase made a bid for the Seven Network. They were both bidding far too much. And the Fairfax people looked at it, I think they almost tossed a coin and said, Scase, you have got it. Scase uh, was going to go broke. But the point was, uh, he so wanted the media, at that point of time anyway, that he was prepared to mortgage his soul for it. Kerry Stokes heeded the motto, go west, young man, when he was just 19. When he walked off the plane and saw the place, he booked his return ticket straight back to Melbourne. But he did stay. 
His first deals were in real estate, and then he began developing supermarkets, the first really big centres in Australia. He was hugely successful, but then he began looking for new fields to conquer. In most of the areas, I lost interest. There's only so many shopping centres you can build. A number of things make Kerry Stokes seem different from other entrepreneurs. For a start, he seems like a pretty decent sort of a bloke. Secondly, he spends his money better than many. Sure, he has his toys, but he has also collected an extraordinary amount of precious Australiana, art and historical objects. And this is the, this is the actual original cover, isn't it, of, uh, of the Sentimental Blokes? It's so the very first copy. It's the very first copy of the book, which they inserted that page. Stokes's multi-million dollar collection ranges from colonial to modern day. It comprises literally hundreds of works by artists such as Nolan, Boyd, Blackman, Lindsay, Glover and Streeton. He was painting 1890s at the Heidelberg School with that romanticism and, and this is later in the 20s when he was in Canada and he set a heavier brush. Yeah, just a little more uptight. This is beautiful, isn't it? The, 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 uh, uh, time in Europe. Yeah. But man cannot live by art alone. Stokes is also in the fashion business. He has a great admiration for creative people, which he says he's not. It's one of the reasons he rescued the faltering business of his friend, fashion designer Jill Fitzsimon, with an injection of more than a million dollars. When we had problems and I spoke to him about it, it was sort of a situation where he felt he could really help, and he did. It was a decision which changed yeah, Kerry Stokes's destiny. That's actually probably a whole mini-series in itself. It is stuff for a mini-series, and there are plenty of beautiful women in this story too. In the early stages when Kerry was involved in the business and we were doing a big parade at the Regent Hotel in Sydney, she was there and she was wearing, for her finale garment, an extraordinary red dress. I really remember that the red dress just set off the uh, white skin and the black hair. He saw this woman on the catwalk and thought she was, I think he said, the most beautiful woman he'd ever seen. She uh, obviously attracted me, no question. It would be another year before Peter Tapano and Kerry Stokes even spoke. Peter starring in Les Mis in Perth, Kerry making a rare but calculated appearance on opening night. I think he, he went up to her and uh, he didn't say hello on Kerry Stokes or anything from the way she tells the story. When you work with somebody who is a famous film star, who is a famous television actor, who is beautiful, I mean, what is there you can possibly hope to talk about that not more than 200 other guys haven't yes. been before you using the same words? So the only thing you can talk about is what you know best. But went up and said, do you like diving? She thought he was a bit odd because she said something like, this guy must be imagining me with the tank on the back and flippers. We actually live quite a frugal life. Um, people um, tend to think... <laughs> Kerry Stokes. <laughs> We're sitting on a 58-foot boat here, yeah. one of three boats owned by Kerry Stokes. I can't call that frugal, I'm sorry. OK, well, we certainly live reclusively. Uh, and we don't, we don't uh, go out a great deal. We tend to stay with ourselves and our family mm -hmm. um, and enjoy each other's company and enjoy each other's um, um, work. Well, they might call it frugal. We might call it a fairy tale. This is the little house Kerry bought Peter in Sydney, two and a half million bucks worth. And this is Kerry's joint in Perth in what's called Millionaire's Row. Not a bad love nest to start the rest of your life in, so the only question left is, will the entrepreneur and the actress live happily ever after? Peter Tapano and Kerry Stokes, the Perth businessman who's in serious danger of looking like a 20th century renaissance man. Coming up next on Inside Edition, Rick Kirkham joins us with a story of betrayal, misery and ultimately reconciliation. He told me I had lost the baby, it was stillborn. This woman believed her husband and mourned the loss of her child. Now, after 20 years, she's crying again. She says he lied to her and sold their baby for cash. So you just told Linda that it was born dead? Yes.
Now, a truly amazing story. Imagine you give birth to a child, only to be told the baby was born dead. Then imagine you discover 20 years later your child was stolen and sold to the highest bidder. Well, joining us now from Inside Edition in America is Rick Kirkham, who covered this tragic story. Rick, welcome to Australia, mate. Well, thanks, Peter. It's great to be here and part of Inside Edition in Australia. We've uh, enjoyed many of your stories, of course, but uh, how did this one come about? A fascinating story, Peter. It really is. This story drew an enormous response and it was shown recently in the United States. It's a terrible tale of sadness and ultimately triumph. A woman discovers her ex-husband sold her baby and 20 years later she finds her child again. But now the daughter, who's grown up, thinks her mother abandoned her. In 1972, Linda, a mother of two daughters and a son, was married to Bill Morrison, a wife-abusing alcoholic ex-convict with a lengthy criminal record. The Morrisons lived in poverty, and when Mr. Morrison learned that Linda was pregnant again, she says he forced her to adopt out her two daughters. She didn't dare go against her abusive husband's wishes. I was sure that it was a nice couple that wanted them and that they would go together. That was the only condition. In the early morning hours of October 31st, 1972, Linda was brought here to this hospital in Sherman, Texas, ready to give birth. However, from the moment Linda entered the hospital, she was treated unlike most expectant mothers. First of all, she was placed in a room away from the maternity ward. And second, Linda was so heavily sedated throughout her four-day stay here that she doesn't even recall giving birth. And I knew that I shouldn't have been in bed with IVs in me because that had never happened before. And he told me I had lost the baby. It was stillborn. It had been a little boy. Linda says she learned the horrible truth only after searching through the library of records 19 years later. Linda found no death certificate for her stillborn boy. What she did find was a live birth certificate for a little girl. I thought, well, I'm going to sit here a few minutes and I'm going to look and look, make sure my eyes aren't tricking me. The shock of discovering she had a daughter somewhere she had never known about led Linda to this private investigator. The more I learned, the more that I knew and I was convinced in my heart that Linda was not lying. Tim Hodgkin's investigation turned up surprising evidence. Linda's child had apparently been adopted out without her knowledge of its existence. In my opinion, it was a illegal adoption. Tim Hodgkin's investigation then led him to find the little girl Linda never knew. He found the girl and her alleged adopted parents in Phoenix. But that little girl, now a grown woman, wanted nothing to do with her real mother. Wendy Glass had been told that her real mother had abandoned her at birth. Wendy did agree to meet with Linda once, but the reunion didn't go well. She keeps accusing me of abandoning her. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I'm, I was given up. I mean, if I have the title as a foster child or if I have a title as an adopted child, that's fine with me. I'm a human being. All I did was come out of the mother's stomach, and that was it. Paul and Judith Glass, the couple that raised Wendy from the time she was just an infant, now live here in this home in Scottsdale, Arizona. The Glasses have refused to talk to anyone about this controversy. In addition, they will not show any documentation that would legally prove they adopted the child. Linda has now filed a civil suit in court, a last attempt, she says, to force the truth to the surface, to prove to her daughter she never knew of Wendy's existence. The suit names Wendy's adoptive parents and the attorney involved in the adoption. Wendy Glass says she would only believe her real mother's story if she heard it from someone else, someone like her real father, a known drifter who hasn't had an address in years. We managed to track down Bill Morrison to just outside Denver, Colorado. After two days, I managed to find him and asked about the truth behind Wendy's adoption. At first, Morrison lied, sticking to the story that he told his wife 20 years ago. I told her that, why don't she leave the kid rest? The kid is dead. Let the child die. But after tripping himself up in his own lies, the truth began to surface. The child was born. That's all I know. Finally, saying God had given him cancer and handed him a rotten life because of what he'd done, Morrison told the whole story. So you, so you just told Linda that it was born dead? Yes. And then, then just adopted it out? It was, we didn't even see the kid. They had Linda under sedation. Hey, what's up, guy? After, hey, how's the arm doing? And the truth is... 
me and the doctor and the lawyer decided for the medical reasons it was best that Linda not know she had to get. Bill Morrison later admitted he had been paid $1,000 by the attorney, who allegedly told Morrison he had been paid much more selling the baby to the new adoptive parents. With that information, we decided to confront attorney Albert Levitin in Dallas after he refused to be interviewed. Did you conspire with her husband to tell her her baby was dead, sir? and sell it the to answer, a couple? Absolutely not. Absolutely not? Absolutely not. You did not. Further investigation of attorney Levitin has revealed he has a criminal record in which Levitin was indicted and later convicted of baby selling in a completely unrelated case. Did you ever tell this woman that her baby was dead? I never told her or anyone else that her baby was dead. If they call you into court to testify on this thing, Bill, are you going to... I'll testify to the best of my knowledge. Meanwhile, Tim Hodgkin says he doubts this is an isolated case. And there may be other births that this has come up that the mother's been told it's stillborn. As Inside Edition was first broadcasting this story, I invited Wendy Glass to join me here at this Phoenix hotel to watch that show. There were a number of firsts for Wendy. For the very first time, she got to see her real father's face. But more importantly, Wendy got to see proof positive that her real mother really never knew of her existence. Wendy appeared amazed as she watched the controversial story of her own birth on national television. But it was the pictures of her real father and his confession that Wendy had been waiting for. Doesn't look like us. After hearing the indisputable truth that she had been adopted out without her real mother even knowing of her existence, Wendy picked up the phone and called Linda. Linda? Yes. It's Wendy. Hi, how are you doing? Good, how are you? I'm, I'm fine. Well, I just watched the video. And I guess I do believe it, but I don't want to believe it. Because I don't want to be have a title as stolen. And I don't think that you abandoned me. No, I don't. I, well, I believe it because I've heard it twice already. Wendy admits she is disappointed to learn her father was an ex-convict, a man who would sell his own child. It is also hard for her to bear the reality of the controversy surrounding her birth, a controversy in which her real mother is now suing Wendy's adoptive parents and the attorney who allegedly sold Wendy to them. Yes, I had my days of dreaming that one day I'd meet my biological parents. I never thought it would turn out like this. Everyone's like goes on Oprah because it's such a big, you know, it's such a reunion. And but mine was someone's worst nightmare come true. And now it's like I'm fighting for my life. You're saying the lawsuit stands. The lawsuit stand doesn't suit you. the right people. It does not suit my parents. It should be the doctor and the lawyer. Linda Thompson agrees that 20 years of lost time and the cold, plain truth being forced on Wendy has probably ruined any chance of a close relationship. She told me that we could be friends but not mother and daughter. How does that make you feel? <clears throat> Don't make me feel so good, but at least I'll have her as a friend. Still, no matter what happens, Wendy says she's been loved by her adoptive parents for 20 years now. And most important to her is that her adoptive family not suffer while she and Linda try to get to know one another. I'm happy where I am, and I want to stay that way. Mother and daughter are now in contact and hope that they will eventually be able to enjoy the relationship stolen from them all those years ago. Peter? It is an extraordinary uh, story, Rick. And I understand that uh, the way you actually got the story is just about as amazing. It was an interesting uh, concept, I guess, in reporting. I had a hunch on uh, where to find the father. As you well know from seeing the story, the father was the key in cutting through to the daughter, getting her to believe that her mother had actually had the child stolen and not abandoned her. We, uh, we had a tip that the father might be found in Denver, Colorado. He's been homeless for about 15 years. No one's heard from him. I posed as a homeless person, went on the streets, lived on the streets for three and a half days, and ended up finding him. And as you just seen he was able to confess and uh, and he actually ha feels a lot of remorse for what mm -hmm. he did now it must have been incredibly exciting for you that 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 contact that you'd forged on the street after three and a half days in the mm -hmm. cold weather and the cold nights of Denver it was a wonderful feeling to find father uh, but even more wonderful to be able to to realize that uh, we had a chance now to actually bring mother and daughter a little closer mm -hmm. together mm -hmm. after all these years 
A big story in America? I mean, what sort of reaction? Did Huge you story, Peter. Very big. Uh, this story uh, garnered first page news in Dallas, Denver, Phoenix. Uh, the, the police had been looking for this man for years and years and hadn't been able to find him. So the very fact that, that Inside Edition was able to locate him uh, not only uh, impressed them, but it impressed the public because we were able then to give the other side of the story that could never have been told without finding Father. Maybe there's a Pulitzer Prize in there for you, uh, Rick Kirkham. Well, I won't hold my breath. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming down, uh, down under and to the Antipodes and uh, come back soon. Great to be here, Peter. And coming up next on Inside Edition... A real-life hero races for the White House. Who am I? Why am I here? I'm not a politician. Everybody knows that. Remember the film The Killing Fields, Hollywood's view of the genocide of the Cambodian people. The real killing fields are an ongoing reminder of the collective nightmare from which they're still recovering. The Khmer Rouge went unpunished for their horrible crimes against Cambodians. Now they're sabotaging the country's best chance of peace in years. Christopher Zinn reports on Pol Pot's deadly legacy. Sunrise over the Mekong River. 17 years after Pol Pot and the dreaded Khmer Rouge declared it year zero. Life in Phnom Penh is returning to normal. If there can be any such thing in Cambodia. Years of interfactional fighting have taken their terrible toll. Millions of mines guarantee one of the world's largest population of amputees. The United Nations moved in to disarm the warring armies and steer the way to democracy. But for the accidental tourist, there's plenty to see. Hunger for hard currency. One of the most underdeveloped economies in Southeast Asia. The priceless antiquities of Angkor Wat. And one of the bloodiest museums in the world. Tourists have a macabre fascination with crime and punishment. Most focus on the historical fantasy of flagellation. But this is the real McCoy. Welcome to S21. A high school which graduated into Pol Pot's Academy of Atrocities. These classrooms are much as the Khmer Rouge left them in 1978 as they fled the Vietnamese invaders. The bodies may be gone, but the rags are still on the beds, the blood still on the floor, and the writings still on the wall. Year Zero and the Communist Khmer Rouge marched into Phnom Penh. The chairman Mao-inspired clique closed their country to civilization and started all over again. But first, the ruling class had to go. Frog marched into the fields for forced hard labor. Or damned to S21. The intelligentsia, the teachers, people who wore glasses or who spoke a foreign language, even children. The Khmer Rouge meticulously catalogued their victims' final hours. This woman's only crime? To be married to the Deputy Foreign Minister. Look closely and you can see a last solitary tear. It's hard to find anyone in Cambodia today who escaped the horror. My family only <coughs> two people. I and my sister, my old sister. And how many did it used to be? Uh, how many, my family? Eleven. Eleven. And all killed? Yes. Even this famous pop singer was considered a threat to the state. The final tableau reveals a gruesome map of Cambodia. A land of bones running with rivers of blood. A 
powerful piece of anti-Pol Pot propaganda, as is the whole museum, which was preserved by the Vietnamese-backed regime. Yet, there's one more horror. Westerners in the wrong place at the wrong time. The museum identifies Lloyd David Scott as a Perth yachtsman, caught off course. Another victim from Wollongong was forced to confess he was a spy. The several foreigners from Australia, the United States and France who were unlucky enough to fall into Pol Pot's hands were brought to S21 and murdered. Of the Campuchians held here, more than 17,000 were transported to the nearby killing fields and executed. If the road to hell is paved with primroses, the trek to Cambodia's hell on earth was innocuous enough. Who could know what the victims must have felt in those final pathetic moments? What we do know is that they were killed, without the expense of wasting bullets. These are merely the mass graves which have been excavated. The bare statistics are chilling. 86 graves inside opens, 8,985 between the skull and two power full. Over there outside, 43 mass graves not open yet. 43 sites that are yeah, still there, not, open, not opened. Yes. Clothes, shards of bones and teeth litter the earth, and everyone has their own terrible story. The Pol Pot killed my family, the mother, father, sister, the niece, uncle, person, hates and me, only one. You're the only member of your family left? Yes, only one, two days. The killing fields are, of course, a must on any visitor's itinerary. We've seen the Hollywood version, but here's the real thing. But are we paying our respects or merely rubbernecking? It's almost inconceivable to see those grinning skulls and even begin to imagine what really occurred here. After World War II, genocide was never meant to happen again, but it did. The perpetrators were never meant to go unpunished, but they did. The ousted Cambodian leader was accompanied by his wife, a high-ranking member of his regime, Pol Pot is still free, the de facto leader of the Khmer Rouge, which continues to stall the peace process. The terrible irony is that the world must learn to forgive and forget the killing fields. That's the price we've had to pay to keep the powerful Khmer Rouge on Cambodia's shaky road to free and fair elections next May. Negotiators are trying to save the Cambodian peace plan. Right now, they're heading back to Paris to try to pin down the Khmer Rouge and honour the agreement they signed a year ago. If the matter's not settled by November 15, the Secretary-General will tell the United Nations the original Paris agreement is dead. Heaven help the Cambodians if it comes to that. He's a real-life hero. The man who held America's darkest secret in the Vietnam War. Now, Admiral James Stockdale wants to be a heartbeat away from the presidency. Today, Americans are going to the polls to elect the new president of the United States. The contest is close between incumbent president George Bush, the Democratic contender from Arkansas, Bill Clinton, and the wild card, Texan H. Ross Perot. But the most astonishing person in the race is Perot's running mate, Admiral James Stockdale, a man who, after tonight, could be a heartbeat away from the world's most powerful position. On August 5th, 1964, Squadron Commander Jim Stockdale shouted the go code, play ball, into his radio and led his wing on the air attack that opened the Vietnam War. Who am I? Why am I here? 28 years later, he is the vice presidential running mate of election wildcard Ross Perot in a campaign which reverberates with the ghostly echoes of Vietnam. I was there the day it started. I led the first bombing raid against North Vietnam. I was there the day it ended and I was there for everything in between. Stockdale flew 200 combat missions in the first 13 months, almost four a week. Then his luck ran out. Shortly after this picture was taken, he was shot down. Stockdale was not only the highest ranking naval officer to fall into enemy hands, he also held Vietnam's biggest secret. Our response for the present 
will be limited and fitting. President Johnson's pretext for America's escalation of the war had been an alleged attack by the North Vietnamese on the destroyer Maddox in the Gulf of Tonkin. Stockdale knew there had been no such attack as America's commitment to the war escalated and protest at home grew. That information would have been an invaluable propaganda weapon for the North Vietnamese. Americans captured by the North Vietnamese were ill-prepared for the conditions that faced them. Potential leaders like Stockdale were repeatedly tortured and kept chained in solitary confinement. Prisoners who made propaganda statements were paraded before the international press. Captain Harry Jenkins was one of Stockdale's fellow prisoners who became known as the Alcatraz Gang. Well, Admiral Stockdale was an inspiration. You're an inspiration to everyone. I don't think you'll find a POW that doesn't speak in just the highest terms of him. Stockdale set up a command structure and maintained the prisoners' morale and discipline. He invented a system of communicating with other isolated prisoners. It's a, an old one that has been used since the Greeks. A five by five matrix for a 25 letter alphabet. And A would be B, C, D, E. He insisted his men take as much torture as they could stand before submitting to the enemy's demands. Captain Eugene Red McDaniels was also a fellow prisoner. Physical, physical torture would be rope torture, uh, deprived without sleep for long days and nights, in my case, seven days, seven nights. I'm sure he experienced the same thing. Leg irons, 24 hours a day, sometimes for months at a time. Yet when Captain Jenkins cracked under torture, Stockdale supported him. And when I told him what I've done, and he came back with, welcome to the club. I, that was the, the most uplifting thing that could have been said because I knew suddenly that I was not, not the, the sole traitor there, or a traitor, I'll put it that way. Once, fearing he would be forced to take part in a propaganda film, Stockdale beat himself with a stool and slashed his head. On another occasion, he slashed his wrist. They finally dove him to the point where he uh, attempted to, to kill himself rather than make this movie. And this was the, he, as far as he'd reached, as far as he could go and still resist, and he was ready to do that. Stockdale and other prisoners endured the hardships for eight years. When he was finally freed at the end of the war, he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor to add to 26 other decorations and promoted to admiral. The best thing I had going for me was I had no contact with Washington for all those years. Stockdale is a hero to former POWs and to thousands of Vietnam vets, particularly those who believe there are still prisoners in Southeast Asia. And the results of the election, and possibly the future of the world, will be known early tomorrow our time. Still to come on Inside Edition. I mean, my friends do have a little more of that um, kind of support that everyone needs, but boxer shorts uh, have a much more, um, you know, free-flowing attitude towards um, the midsection of the body. Inside Edition goes undercover on the new Boxer Rebellion. I'm too sexy for my shirt, too sexy for my shirt. So